All right. Uh, well, welcome to our session. We'll introduce them in just a moment, and we're looking at some of the sponsors and supporters today. We'll start um, briefly with just a, a quick map um, of where we all are. Um, and I know one of us can't see the whiteboard right now, so maybe you can type into the chat box where you are located today. And for those of us who can see the map, um, go ahead and click on the um, on the toolbar on the left side of the of the whiteboard, and you can click as I'm doing. You'll see we're putting our our sun marker right on Seattle, Washington, uh, where we're located, and we have uh, Yunhee from New York. We'll just put you over here. Whoops. Well, it's not letting me do more than one. So, envision New York. Okay. Um, you need to check the chat box for some messages from Steve. He'll help you out. All right. So our presentation today, our session is called Advancing Global Education Through Teacher Leadership. And uh, we'll start just by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Noah Zeichner. I'm a National Board Certified Social Studies teacher at Chief South International High School in the Seattle Public School District. Hi, I'm Michelle Antioaoki, and I'm the International Education Administrator for Seattle Public Schools, and I also serve as the Director of the Confucius Institute at the State of Washington Education Center here, which is located at NOAA School. So with the short amount of time that we have today, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of context, uh, some background of international education in Seattle Public Schools. And then the primary topic will be to share the evolution of teacher leadership in our international schools. Um, so we have 10 international schools in Seattle. Uh, and this is a local designation, a local network of schools, five elementary schools, three middle schools, and two high schools. And the schools share a vision, uh, which is stated on the slide here, to prepare students in partnership with families and community for global citizenship in an increasingly interdependent world. And what you're looking at here is a graphic um, that shows the framework for our international schools in Seattle. Um, in the center, in green, you see three areas of international education, uh, global competency and cultural competency, world languages, and global perspective. And these are the three areas that are actually mentioned in our school board policy in our district that define international education. Um, what you see on the top in blue are the four domains of global competence from CCSSO, Asian Society, EdSteps. Um, this is the framework we use in Seattle and all of our international schools for designing units, planning curriculum, um, and thinking through uh, global education. And on the bottom in yellow, um, these are 21st century skills that our school district names in our school district's strategic plan. Uh, so we wanted to show the sources um, of all of the um, uh, all of the jargon that is associated uh, with international education in our district. Do you want to add anything to that, Michelle? Yeah, I just mentioned that at the center is global citizens, and interestingly, that actually ties into our state's goal for basic education, which is to prepare responsible and uh, a respectful global citizen. So it's right there as a connection to the state goal. And here you just see a map. I mentioned that there are 10 schools, uh, and we're divided into three regions, uh, three pathways. Um, the school where I have taught for the past 12 years is on the right side of the screen, Chief South International High School. And in each of these three pathways, we have um, different language immersion options for students. So at the elementary level in our international schools, students are in a 50-50 dual language model where they are learning half the day approximately in English and half the day in either Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese, or Japanese. Um, in the West Seattle pathway uh, where I work, uh, we have the most developed immersion program in Spanish where we are now offering um, content courses, social studies courses, world history, for example, taught in Spanish um, as part of the program. 
And if you do have questions, by the way, feel free to throw them into the chat box. I might just mention that the white boxes are two schools that have been identified as uh, the continuation steps for the expansion of the program so that we'd have a complete pathway with two elementaries feeding to a middle, feeding to a high school. And you, as you see, a couple are still blank. And we're actually in the process right now in the district of a task force to help determine whether there's actually commitment to complete those pathways. All right, and this slide just shows um, uh, several examples of some of the things that our school, uh, features of our school at Chief South that we would say make it an international school. Uh, so we incorporate um, our international baccalaureate program into our overarching international school program. Um, we have exchange programs. We really emphasize the importance of international travel and study to our students. and and connect them to those opportunities. We have interdisciplinary um, projects that focus on global issues such as water scarcity and water conservation. Uh, for years, we put on um, a school-wide program called World Water Week. Uh, last year, we hosted um, our first state global issues network conference at our school. So all of these things combined um, make our school international, we believe. Um, but this is a challenge. Uh, as each school has, has joined the network of international schools uh, and has had to ask the question, what does that really mean to be an international school? What does global education really mean? A natural reaction from teachers and staff is, whoa, hold on, we have so many things on our plate, we can't add one more thing, one more initiative. And we make the point um, that international education or global education uh, doesn't need to be seen as a separate initiative. Um, it really um, is, is the context for everything that we do. So in other words, global education is the plate. So we try intentionally to connect our curriculum, our school-wide programming, connect all of it to the four domains of global competence. We also have a, a unique process in our, in our 10 international schools in our school district where um, teachers can earn a special category, and in this case, a category is is a district level teaching endorsement. It's not an endorsement in the sense of uh, one that the state would would offer teachers for their teaching certificate, um, but it's a district level designation that demonstrates that teachers are uh, showing competencies in being global educators. Well, and all the elements in the policy. They have to uh, plan out how they are going to provide evidence of, of their work plus their students' work that show global perspective and cultural and global competence, world languages. Even teachers who are not teaching a language program, there are things they can do within their school that shows that they understand the wealth of languages there, that they're supporting all students to have opportunities to learn languages and to learn content uh, through languages and so on. So this was, I'm actually new to the district in my position since uh, September of 2014. So this was one of the first things that landed on my lap. Oh, I get to evaluate along with the principals whether these teachers are qualified to receive this category. And just I might mention, what does it mean to have the category? It really just means that it, it gives you preferential placement in one of the international schools so that if uh, you could have been bumped, for example, from a social studies position, but you had the category, then someone who didn't have that couldn't just bump you because of time. So it, the process to do it is really interesting. A, a lot of our teachers are already doing this kind of without even realizing that, they, that they're uh, collecting that kind of evidence, doing units. It's just the way they're teaching. But when they have to stop for a moment and think about, okay, how do I actually reflect on these things, pull that evidence together, and share it, um, I've now found it, having probably reviewed at least 20 sets of evidence by now, that it's a very powerful process. It's not nearly as onerous as doing something as national board certification, but it does make people stop for a moment and become aware of what they're doing, how they're working in collaboration with other teaching partners and so on. And so it's been, a, I think it's a very useful thing and it's an example of how you build leadership 
by offering an opportunity for teachers to take that moment to reflect, have it acknowledged by the system, and, uh, and then what I find is that those teachers are the ones that are ready to step into leadership roles because they have a level of confidence about what they're doing because they, they took that step of, of specifically acknowledging. So we've given you a little bit of the layout. Um, the only other point that we'll mention before we get into the main topic of teacher leadership uh, is that all of this is all of this work around global education in Seattle Public Schools is carried out through uh, partnerships with local um, and in some cases national and global uh, organizations. Uh, so you see a few of the organizations on the screen here. Our local World Affairs Council is a big partner. They have a global classroom program for teachers that put on workshops throughout the year and we partner with them. Um, the Confucius Institute of the State of Washington, Michelle mentioned she works um, as part of that uh, entity. Uh, One World Now is a Seattle-based nonprofit that that um, has a, a language program for students and international travel and, and leadership program, uh, extracurricular. Um, Global, Vision, Global Visionaries also locally based, um, travels with students to Guatemala throughout the year, but we also offer an in-school um, Global Visionaries program uh, called Global Leadership Class. And Facing the Future, some of you might be aware of, um, produces high quality global issues uh, curriculum. So these are our partners um, in our work. So we're going to talk right now about how teacher leadership has evolved in our 10 international schools. Um, around 2011, a, a group was formed of about 10 teachers representing, at that time, um, the seven or eight international schools in, in the district. And our initial goal was simply to connect the schools and have cross-school conversations about what does it mean to be an international school. Um, let's share resources. Let's create some model lesson plans that we can share with newer teachers at our international schools. And in those first couple years of meeting as a group, uh, we put on at the end of each year an international school symposium, uh, which was about 500 teachers coming together, getting into uh, classrooms and sharing resources and building partnerships and, and networking and so on. And that happened for a couple of years. Um, the next phase uh, started in 2013-14, where we got some funding from the district in the second half of that year where the members of this leadership team uh, received a stipend uh, for the additional time and work they put in to um, leading in their schools. Um, in the following year, last year, uh, we got a little more funding from the district to be able to distribute one teaching position into four hybrid roles. So to support international education in these 10 schools, the school district could have said, we're going to hire um, an additional staff person for the central office uh, to sit in a cubicle and support Michelle in her position as international education administrator. But um, very wisely, the decision was made to empower teachers inside of the schools to release them 0.2 or 0.4 of their time um, so they could lead from within the schools. Um, and it, it's been quite effective. Last year, this group, International Schools Leadership Team, uh, we collaborated to produce uh, a series of professional learning modules to really address all of the areas that you saw in that original graphic, um, the four domains of global competence, for example. How can we support our colleagues and teachers coming into our schools, our international schools, um, to feel confident in being a global educator? And so some of those, you'll see some of those topics of professional learning modules here on the screen. Um, the first one, Internet Introduction to Global Education, um, we have used uh, several times now as a new teacher orientation for teachers in all of the 10 schools who are just coming into international education. Um, and the rest of these, we've been leading them in schools uh, as professional development, whole staff professional development, um, optional uh, opt-in professional development, and coming up next month on May 21st, we'll be putting on a new international school symposium using these modules as the core uh, workshop offerings. 
you know, I just want to add that part of the reason we believe this was work, uh, that this would work, this approach with uh, teacher leaders and the hybrid roles, uh, is that Seattle has been fortunate to be part of the Global Cities Education Network, or GSEN, with the Asia Society and with uh, 10 international cities, five in Asia, five in the North America, now an 11th has joined too. And when you travel to places like Singapore and Shanghai and Toronto and you see what those people are doing around teacher leadership, you get it, that it can work, and you see how powerful it is for the teachers themselves and how it transforms their classroom practice and how it allows you to get the best of both worlds, to keep great people working directly with students, which benefits the students, but also getting them to share a little broader so they improve the, the teaching uh, of their colleagues and benefit the entire district in that sense. So I, I'm a, a big believer in this approach. And I'll, and I'll mention that for the teachers who serve on this International Schools Leadership Team, last year we, um, we had varying levels of involvement. So there were four of us who formed the core leadership team. Uh, we were the lead teachers on this on this team, and um, there, that's where the one FTE uh, position was distributed. So there were um, two elementary teachers who were each released 0.2 of their time. There was a middle school lead who was released 0.4, and I was released 0.2. And we would meet weekly and um, do a lot of the connecting work and supporting large-scale projects in our schools and helping schools uh, replicate projects that other schools had started. Um, the next tier of involvement and leadership uh, was a group of about seven teachers or so who received stipends, and they were involved in committee work and small project work, or they were leading some of the development of the professional learning modules. Um, so they were not released during the day, but they were compensated for, for their work. And then there was a whole, another group of of seven or eight people who did not have the time to commit last year to um, uh, justify a stipend, but they wanted to be involved and they came to the meetings and so they were receiving uh, extra time pay for their, for their participation. So the funding that the district committed to support this teacher leadership work was distributed in different ways uh, depending on, on the, um, the time commitments that teachers were able to make. Yeah, one thing that was crucial there is that the teachers who generally have the hardest time taking the time or taking the, on a stipend are the teachers who are teaching in the dual language immersion programs because usually they're teaching two classes, half a day say K and half a day first grade. So they just cannot free themselves up that much or even get subs that often, but they can definitely come and be involved and have a voice. And it was very, very powerful, especially since a lot of our teachers have been educated in other countries. And so to have their voice, when you're working on things like social justice, you know, we see that through one lens when we're Americans, and you see it through a very different lens if you've come from Central America. So the fact that we didn't have to demand people to take more time than they could take meant that we could get their voice in there. I think that's just a really important thing to realize. You have to differentiate according to uh, people's situations to get all the voices present. And the hybrid roles really are key. I've done a, a lot of work over the years with uh, the Center for Teaching Quality, and they supported this work initially as well and, and found some grants to release some of my time to, to um, do some of the initial work. And um, Center for Teaching Quality has done a lot of research and work around the power of hybrid roles, and so many teachers have the desire to lead, um, but the opportunities uh, to lead in the profession often involve leaving the classroom. So this is a way where teachers can lead without leaving the classroom, uh, and that was key um, to making this all possible. So we really do believe that um, sustaining the work of global education in a systemic, systemic way in our school district, um, teachers play a critical role. Absolutely. Uh, there is so much turnover in district leadership. Uh, I had an occasion actually to speak about this uh, with the college board when we were over in China in November and we're in a school where the same person has been in a leadership role for about 15 years. It's not difficult for him to have a vision of global leadership and stick to that connection with his partner school in, in Seattle. For us, it's a bit more challenging. So in the last 12 years, we've had five superintendents, 
And the average tenure of a superintendent in a large urban district is about 3.2 years, as you probably know. And at this school, which is one of our premier international schools, they've had turnover of four principals in that time period. So if there were not leaders, teacher leaders, in the schools who really understood what the work is and why it's happening and could just step up as needed, we would lose it here in this district. It's That's where the continuity comes from, that you have a, a uh, rather distributed team, so to speak, where the knowledge is, and you can bring it together. And we, in who are in leadership roles at the district level, have to learn from these teacher leaders in order to keep the work going forward. Well, we, we only have about five minutes left, so we want to make sure we leave you with some some key takeaways and and there's three um, and we do have what was that was that a hand? I think somebody just left oh somebody just left okay um, we do have three um, strategies that we have seen teacher leaders in Seattle's international schools um, really utilize over the past few years uh, the first one speaking the language um, there's so much Oh, sorry, Uni. Let's let's have you ask a question. Do you want to try to use the microphone, or can you hear me? Go ahead. Oh yeah, sure. I didn't want to interrupt just <laughs> to make sure I can have I can ask question. Did you finish your talk, by the way? Not quite, but we're getting there. <laughs> but you can ask a question now. Uh, you can go for. Oh, anyways, I thought you were finished. And I was so, I couldn't see your presentation still, but I listened to what you were saying. And your school district sounds like a really dream <laughs> for global <laughs> education. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, I, I heard the school district actually provide compensation for the school leadership team, right? They, they have. Um, last year they were, this year they are not, but um, we're hopeful that it will be reinstated in the future. Oh, I see. So first of all, just my question here, who did initiate the teacher leader um, leadership activity? Because I really believe and agree that teacher's role is critical, but teacher only, only teacher cannot make things happen in a larger scale when the district and school administration are supportive of teachers' uh, initiative, I think it's going to be very effective. In, so I was wondering if the teacher was the first teacher initiated first or the district come up with this idea and then allow school teachers to do this uh, initiative further? It's a, it's a great question. So how, how did you get started with building a leadership structure like this? Well, when it first started here, um, the, the initiation was from the district and it was a the person at that time in Michelle's role international education administrator reached out to principals at all of the international schools and said who are the leaders in your buildings who are the teachers who are um, demonstrating uh, global competence who are the teachers who are designing the great projects we would like to bring a team together to have them talk. But from that point forward, once the team got together, it was the teachers that demonstrated to the schools and to their principals and to the districts the power of the leadership work that they were doing. So by doing the professional development for their colleagues, by organizing symposia and conferences where people can share ideas, it became very visible and very apparent that this is how the professional learning was going to take place. It wasn't going to come through a top-down, district-wide um, workshop that principals are asked to deliver. And principals often don't have the bandwidth and the time and space to um, take on the detailed work of, of, you know, transforming a school into an international school. So it became clear very fast. You know, it's a, it's a little like the chicken and the egg in the sense that uh, where does it start from? So in a sense, you could go back to the beginning when we were first planning the first international school in Seattle, which is like a whole other presentation. So back in 2000, that school launched. So the principal who did the planning for that, who was then the person who was brought to the district to continue this work and expand it into other schools, 
she understood that no, but none of us that were on the planning teams really knew what we were trying to create. So that was an empowering moment for community members, certainly teachers in the new school and so on. So that's where you just have to sort of start with the idea and it can be a collective idea with community members, teachers, a leader, and you start to build something. And if you can get something going, then you it's sort of like you've got the chicken or the egg, whichever one needs to come first. And then from there, you've got a cycle that can be self-generating. But you just try to get that critical mass, and anybody can be a leader to try to make that go forward. And that's actually a great segue to this last slide here. We're just we're going to wrap things up. And these are just these are suggestions for teachers who want to take on more of a leadership role in their schools and their districts. And the first strategy is to speak the language because there really is so much jargon used in education today. And within global education, we hear international education, 21st century skills, global competencies, career and college ready, deeper learning, the list goes on and on. And so it is up to us teacher leaders to help um, our colleagues, our administrators, our parents, um, understand how all of those concepts and initiatives fit together. Um, and we can play a role in helping people understand that. Um, creating shared experiences. If you are in a school uh, that does not yet have a, a collective shared international vision, um, then one way to create that is to um, develop shared learning experiences. So, for example, at our school, we put on World Water Week for four years, which was a school-wide festival, a week-long event where, with workshops and teacher trainings and student-led sessions and keynote speakers and a, and a conference. And people didn't, who were not um, really aware of global education didn't really have to do anything at first. They just showed up. And little by little, the question started to come, well, how do I get involved? How can I start doing things like this in my classroom? And so um, creating shared experiences for your school is a great strategy. And, and finally, navigating competing priorities. Um, we are uh, asked to do so many things all the time. And we have, uh, we, we have to navigate common core state standards, standardized tests, new teacher evaluation systems, school discipline programs. Um, so there's no shortage of issues that principals and teachers have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, so often it is teachers at the classroom level who are uh, in the best position to evaluate the direct impact of many of these initiatives on student learning and student engagement and to find ways to place those initiatives in a global context. And so that's a real role for teachers um, to take on. Um, schools don't really need the name international in their title uh, to offer a global education for their students. And in addition to Seattle's international schools, many of you are aware of the Asia Society's International Studies Schools Network and numerous other schools around the country and around the world that offer a global education. Um, but it, if a system does want to um, develop a global education network or to globalize schools system-wide, it really is critical that teachers are in the middle of that work. Michelle, did you want to add anything to close? You know, what just occurred to me, we're always looking for what's an analogy, how do we get the idea of like global education is the plate, and it just occurred to me, you know, I, I'm, I have my glasses off and I, it, the world is out there, it's the world, but I see it kind of fuzzily, these are my eyes. If I put my glasses on, I can see it really clearly, and that's to me what global education is. The world is still the world, my eyes are still my eyes, but I have a tool that helps me see things in a much clearer way. And that's really the perspective when we decide to engage in global education. We decide to put some glasses on that allow us now, contacts or glasses, that allow our eyes to see things in a much clearer way. Now, why would we take those off and say we're not going to do global education? <laughs> Good question. All right, we are officially out of time. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this uh, time with us, and we will see you online. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of your conference.